I want your soul. The past few years have been an absolute whirlwind for me. For years, I was a struggling writer, dreaming of becoming the next great American author. But I simply couldn't break into the literary industry. I survived for a time on freelance jobs, ranging from article writing and blogging to copywriting and editing. They say every dog has his day. Mine arrived nearly two years ago when my debut horror novel, Fragments of Fear, exceeded my wildest expectations and became an unexpected hit. It landed on the New York Times bestseller list, with reviews describing it as an atmospheric and chilling journey into the depths of human darkness. I hadn't reached Stephen King levels of name recognition, but copies of my book were front and center in bookstores. I even got to go on a 10-city book signing tour and participate in a few talk show interviews. My brush with fame made me wary of the limelight, so with the earnings from my book sales, I purchased a two-story house in the suburbs. The house wasn't extravagant, but it was far removed from the bustling city and the demanding publishing industry. It became my sanctuary, a place to find solace, recharge my creative energy, and explore my imagination without distraction. It was an older house and required some work, but I was excited at the prospect of making it my own. At the top of my to-do list, but I was excited at the prospect of making it my own. At the top of my to-do list was refurbishing the large backyard. I had always envisioned starting a family and imagined barbecues and children playing in the yard. Unfortunately, years of neglect had turned the backyard into a dense jungle of weeds and poison oak. I spent the better part of an afternoon meticulously mowing the lawn and pulling the weeds. Afterward, I began planting a new garden. While digging a hole in the soil for some potted flowers next to an old oak tree, my spade hit something solid. The metallic clang reverberated through the air. Fearing that I had struck a water or gas pipe, I put my shovel down and carefully brushed away the loose soil with my gloved hands. What I uncovered was a small weathered metal box buried just below the surface. The box was light, but it felt sturdy. A blend of excitement and curiosity took over as I gently pried the box open with the head of my spade. Inside was a collection of old black and white family photographs of a couple and their young daughter. There were also trinkets, likely of sentimental value to the box's owner. A tarnished silver locket with a picture of a Labrador retriever, a small vial of sand and a porcelain figurine of a ballerina. Based on the contents, I surmised it was some sort of a time capsule. But what made my blood run cold was a sealed envelope bearing my full name and the current date, written in cursive. How could it be? This was impossible. Judging by the photographs, the box must have been buried sometime in the 1920s. I dropped everything I was doing and brought the box inside. Opening the envelope, I found a letter that read, Dear Mr. Travers, if you are reading this, just know that in five days, your life will end. We know this because we were the ones who brought about your demise. We apologize for this harsh reality, but implore you to understand the desperation that compels us. We seek to bring back our daughter, Lily, from the clutches of death, and your sacrifice is the price demanded. We deeply regret the burden we have placed upon you, extending across time. Please know our intentions are not cruel, but driven by unconditional love. We understand the enormity of this request. May you find some solace in knowing that your sacrifice holds the promise of restoring Lily's future. With heartfelt gratitude, Evelyn and William Hastings. P.S. As a small consolation, we have provided you with a glimpse into the upcoming week. A separate sheet is listed here for you with dates of the next five days, each with a prediction. July 15th. A stranger will cross your path 
seeking a favor. July 16th. A creature of the night will find its way into your sanctuary. July 17th. The sky will weep for you, but you will find only darkness in these tears. July 18th. Your most beloved creation will betray you. July 19th. Through flames, a cherished life will be consumed. I put the letter down. After reading this, I was left in a state of confusion and disbelief. There was no way this letter could be real, I thought. I'd had my fair share of obsessive fans sending me ideas for my next novel or their unedited manuscripts and it wasn't a stretch to imagine that a deranged fan or a prankster with a twisted sense of humor had discovered my new address and devised this elaborate hoax. Whoever was behind it, I had to give them credit for their creativity, though. They had the makings of a great horror writer. I returned the contents to the box, closed the lid, and set it aside. I made a mental note to change all the locks, and then I returned to my yard work. The next day, I was busy patching a crack in my living room wall when I heard a heavy knock at the door. I wasn't expecting any visitors, so I slowly opened the door a crack and kept the chain lock still in place. Standing on my porch was a man, tall and lean, with disheveled black hair. Yes, can I help you? I asked warily. Hey there, I'm sorry to bother you, he began. But my car broke down in front of your house. I think the carburetor might be busted. He then pointed at a black sedan with its hood popped open and smoke billowing from the engine. I sized him up with a little bit of suspicion. I remembered the prediction about a stranger crossing my path. I hadn't thought the letter had literally predicted a stranger coming to my house and asking for my help. Instead, I wondered if this guy was the one who had buried the box in my backyard as a prank. Cautiously, I offered to call a tow truck for him while he waited outside, and he happily agreed. I closed the door behind me and called the towing company, and the man patiently waited on my front porch until the truck arrived. He thanked me with a smile and left with the truck driver. But on his way out, and when the truck driver loaded the car onto the tow, I noticed something very odd. On the back of the license plate of the car, it was customized and said, Mr. Grinless. I don't think I've ever heard a name like that before. It's very strange. For the remainder of the day, I peered out my window to see if this man returned, but I never saw him again. I convinced myself that this was just a coincidence, and as far as coincidences go, it wasn't the most absurd. I mean, stranger things have happened. The following day, The bizarre time capsule and its unsettling prophecy still occupied the forefront of my mind. However, when my agent called, inquiring as to why I hadn't replied to his multiple emails, I was thrust back into the reality of my professional obligations. The publisher had been breathing down his neck due to my delay in submitting drafts for my much-anticipated second novel. I was contractually bound to deliver a complete draft by the year's end. Just one chapter, Alex, he pleaded. A rough draft. Anything. Anything you can do. It'll pacify them for at least a month. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. I'll have it ready by the end of the week. I assured him, placating his concerns. Secluding myself in my office, I faced my laptop with grim determination. I vowed not to leave for any reason until I had accomplished a writing goal of 2,000 words. By 10 o'clock, I was sitting in the dark with my laptop screen as the only source of light. I had managed to produce only about a thousand words. Feeling somewhat claustrophobic in my small, stuffy office, I opened the window to let the crisp night air sweep in, carrying the scent of wet grass and the faint rustling of leaves. I took a deep breath and leaned back into my chair, closing my eyes for a moment. Suddenly, a loud flapping sound jolted me back to reality. I jumped from my chair, my heart pounding in my chest. From the darkness of the night, a shadowy figure then swooped into my office. Panicked, I ducked, my mind rushing back to the note's prophecy about a creature of the night. Was this it? The figure collided with my bookshelf, sending my book showering to the floor, and hooted loudly before landing on my desk. Gathering my courage, I switched on the desk lamp. 
The room was instantly bathed in a warm glow, revealing my intruder, a barn owl. With an eeriness that sent a chill down my spine, the owl slowly turned its head almost 360 degrees, like a scene out of The Exorcist, observing its surroundings. I had never been this close to an owl before, and I hadn't realized how large they could get. This particular one was almost the size of a young child. Hey there, easy now, I said, grabbing a flashlight from my desk. I slowly approached it, still crouched, with my flashlight arm extended. Before I could get very far, the owl spread its wings wide. With a powerful flap, it took off again, sweeping across my office and flying straight out of my window. My meticulously organized notes fell victim to the gusts created by the owl's wings, scattering across the room like confetti. I poked my head out the window and followed the bird with the flashlight beam. I saw it glide into the tree line and it was slightly unnerving how its flapping wings barely made a noise. It perched on a branch, turning its head around to look back at me, its massive eyes reflecting back my light. I jumped back, shutting the window with a bang. As I paced around the room, cleaning the mess that the owl had created, I felt a sense of unease. One prediction coming true. I could pass off as a coincidence, but this one was oddly specific. I was starting to fear for my life, but what could I do? Go to the police? I would be sent for a psych evaluation before I was able to even finish my story. I couldn't sleep for the rest of the night. Instead, I stayed up, researching everything I could find about the history of the house and the family in the photograph. The articles I found about the house revealed that it was built in the 1880s and had changed hands several times before being bought by a young couple, William and Evelyn Hastings, in 1921. They had a daughter named Lily Margaret Hastings in 1922. I found a news article from 1927 titled, Miracle Child, Thought Dead Wakes Up at a Funeral. The article revealed that Lily had fallen into a frozen lake when she was five years old. She wasn't breathing when her father pulled her out and was declared dead. As embalming wasn't common at the time, her funeral was held the very next day. The article reported that as they were lowering her casket into the grave, mourners heard faint scratching from within. When they ripped open the lid, they found the child shaken, but very much alive. Doctors were baffled at how she had survived the whole experience. The theory posed in the article was that the icy water had put her into a deep coma where her breathing and heartbeat were too faint to detect. The only other significant thing I found was an obituary for Lily from 2019. She had lived a long, full life, after all, and passed away peacefully in her sleep at the age of 97 years old. She was survived by two children, six grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. The obituary noted her love for dogs and the beach, and her career as a professional ballerina. And that explains the trinkets, I muttered to myself. The obituary was written by her granddaughter, Hannah Sullivan, who was the local head librarian. I took a glance at my watch and it was already 5 a.m. I could see outside that the morning brought a dense layer of cloud cover. As predicted, a sudden and violent storm swept over the neighborhood, casting a shadowy gloom that echoed in my inner turmoil. My rational side still insisted that this was all an elaborate prank, but the creeping doubt in my mind was growing stronger with each passing hour. I reasoned that if anybody had any answers, it would be Hannah Sullivan. I looked up the library where she worked and saw it was only a 20 minute drive away. I waited for the storm to break before heading out and by 10 a.m. the storm showed no signs of letting up, but I was desperate for answers. I tucked the letter and the photos into my coat pocket and ran to my car. I drove through the rain soaked roads, the wipers screeching as they moved across the windshield. As I pulled into the library's parking lot, I noticed that it was nearly empty, with only a few other cars present. The library itself was a Victorian building that looked like it had been recently remodeled. Entering the library, I found it almost deserted except for a young woman at the reception desk. She was engrossed in a book, her glasses perched on her nose and her dark hair tied up in a messy ponytail. I glanced at what she was reading and saw that it was a copy of my book. I decided to approach her gingerly. I was soaking wet and still unsure of how to explain my strange predicament without sounding 
like I was fucking crazy. As I neared the desk, she looked up, setting her book aside and offering me a warm smile. Hello, she said, her eyes brightening behind her glasses. Can I help you find anything? Yeah, yeah, I'm actually here to find Hannah Sullivan, I replied, meeting her gaze. I read that she works here. The woman looked at me with suspicion. May I ask who is asking for her, she said. I knew I just couldn't tell her my true reason for needing to see her. I literally had one card to play. I decided to pull out a business card from my pocket and slid it across the desk. She read it, her eyes widening. The Alex Travers, the author of Fragments of Fear, she asked excitedly. She checked the photo on the inside of her book's jacket to confirm. And I concocted a convincing lie about wanting to research local lore for my next novel. And after offering to sign a copy of her book, she was more than happy to lead me to a small office tucked away in the corner of the building. She then knocked lightly on the door before opening it. Miss Sullivan, there's someone here to see you. It's actually Alex Travers, the young librarian then added in a giddy tone. Hannah looked up from her computer screen, surprised by the interruption. She was a striking woman in her early thirties, her ginger hair pulled back into a neat bun, and freckles scattered across her cheeks. Her eyes, a brilliant emerald green, and she regarded me with curiosity. She seemed far less impressed with my presence than her colleague. Thank you, Amber she said to the young woman. Amber then lingered at the door, hoping to be a part of the conversation, but she got the hint to leave when she saw that everyone was just standing awkwardly in silence. Mr. Travers, please have a seat, Hannah said, her tone cordial but guarded. To what do I owe this unexpected visit? I sat down in the chair across from her. I hesitated, unsure of how to proceed, but decided to get straight to it. I explained to her that I had recently bought her great-grandparents' house. I reached into my coat pocket and retrieved the weathered photos, laying them on the desk. Hannah's eyes slightly widened as she studied the pictures of her ancestors. I found these in my backyard a couple days ago. They were in a box buried near the old oak tree. There was a flicker of surprise on her face when I said it, and then it was quickly replaced by a look of concern. There was a moment of silence as she traced her finger over the image of the young girl in the picture. And the letter? Was there a letter in the box? She asked. I was shocked. I hadn't even mentioned a letter yet. How did you know there was a letter? I asked, perplexed, handing her the two handwritten sheets of paper. She examined the letter carefully. This is my great-grandmother's handwriting, she said. Okay, but how did she know my name then? None of that makes sense, or the current date. I was stammering now, the fear creeping back into my voice. I just don't understand what's going on here. I'd I'd heard the stories, but I didn't think any of it was true. She spoke, talking more to herself than to me as she looked the photos up and down. What stories? I demanded. Hannah looked at me, her eyes filled with empathy. She sighed deeply and began. Mr. Travers, my family has a rather complicated history. My great-grandmother Evelyn was a spiritualist. She held all sorts of rituals. She believed she could communicate with the dead. You've no doubt read about my grandmother Lily's story, right? I nodded in confirmation. Well, there's a family legend that when Lily drowned in the lake, her mother made a deal with the spirit world to bring her back. Oh? And what was the deal? I probed. A life for a life. Not the life of anyone she knew, but that of someone who would live in the house in the distant future. I thought about what she said for a moment, and suddenly it all clicked. So you're saying that Evelyn traded my life to save her daughter? In a sense, yeah, she confirmed. But this is my life. Do I not get a say in this? I mean, I don't even know this woman. I wasn't alive then. I don't know anybody or any of this stuff has nothing to do with me. I was arguing now. You have to see it from her perspective. She was getting her only child back in exchange for the life of a complete stranger who wouldn't even be born in her lifetime. What parent do you know that wouldn't make that deal? Okay, this is, this is getting really fucking crazy now. Is there any way to reverse this? 
I asked, anxiety in my voice. The rain outside echoed my desperation, fiercely hitting the library's windows. Hannah's face then fell. I don't know. This isn't something I've ever dealt with. As far as I know, no one's ever even tried. You can't just undo three generations of my family's existence. Her words were then cut off by a sudden crash of thunder, and the room darkened as the power went out. Only the sporadic flashes of lightning illuminated the space. God damn it! I shouted now, more from fear than anger. I got up abruptly, knocking my chair to the floor. Are you fucking around with me? Is this your idea of some sick joke? I accused her, fumbling in the darkness towards the door. Hannah gasped, clearly taken aback by my reaction. No, 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 Mr. Travers, I swear I wouldn't joke about something like this. I didn't wait to hear her say anything else. I pushed my way out of the office and navigated the dark library, and found my way to the exit. Outside, the storm was raging, but I didn't care. My mind was spinning, caught in a whirlwind of fear and disbelief. The rain quickly soaked through my clothes, but it did little to dampen the fiery panic, consuming me. I sat in my car, staring at the list of prophecies. The next to the last one worried me almost as much as my own impending demise. As I read the phrase, Your most beloved creation will betray you one more time, a shiver ran down my spine. My first thought was of my book, my characters, but how could fictional characters turn on me? I wondered for a minute. I spent the rest of the day in a daze, trying to piece together the cryptic prophecy. I pored over my manuscript, searching for any character or plot point that could possibly betray me. But I didn't know what I was looking for. I don't even remember falling asleep, but I was awakened by a news alert on my phone. The headline sent a chill through my veins. Fanatical reader commits heinous murder, recreates scene from fragments of fear. I couldn't believe what I was reading. It felt as if the floor had given way beneath me. As I read the gruesome facts of the crime, my heart started pounding frantically. The fan, a man named Robert Miles, was reportedly obsessed with my work, especially the serial killer character, Orion West, from my book. He had been apprehended after strangling his wife, which he claimed was an homage to one of Orion's most brutal killings. Feeling nauseated, I dropped my phone. My mind was racing. In a state of panic, I contacted every spiritualist, paranormal expert, and occultist I could find. All were either incredulous, dismissive, or too eager to exploit my desperation. None were able to offer anything concrete or even plausible. I contemplated boarding a plane and fleeing to the farthest corner of the world, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized how pointless that would be. The prophecy wasn't tied to the house, it was tied to me, and there was no escaping myself. On the morning of July 19th, I woke up with a sense of dread. The final prediction was to be fulfilled that day, and despite the comfort of daylight, the threat felt imminent. My morning passed by in a blur, and my thoughts were consumed by what was to come. The knock on my door in the afternoon is what startled me. When I opened it, I found Hannah standing there. Her green eyes were filled with a mixture of apprehension and hope. She held an old book in one hand and a large bag slung over her shoulder. Mr. Travers, I'm sorry to show up unannounced, she began, but I couldn't stop thinking about our encounter. I think I might have a solution for you. Do you? I asked, trying not to raise my hopes. Yes, if I may come in. Sure, please come on in, I responded, leading her inside. Once inside, she laid the book on my dining room table. I spent all night going through my great-grandmother's old books of spells and rituals, and I found this. She opened the book, directing my attention to a particular page. Life transference spell? I read where her finger indicated. I believe Evelyn used the spell to transfer Lily's death onto you, she explained. Is there a ritual or something to reverse the spell? There is, but there's a catch, she replied, looking at me seriously. Okay, what's the catch? If we do this, it will change everything. She was warning me now. Her voice was grave. 
you'll effectively erase all the events in your life that led you to this house, to this moment. What do you mean by erase? The spell will shift the trajectory of your life away from your current path, Hannah clarified. Your memories, your experiences, they'll all remain intact. However, to the world around you, it will be as if fragments of fear never happened. You would have taken a different path in life, one that wouldn't have led you to writing that particular book and the fame it brought. But that was my life's work, Hannah. That was my dream. I felt a lump forming in my throat. I dedicated years to writing, years to getting my work out there. And now you're telling me I have to give it all up? Just to live? Just to get out of this fucking curse? Hannah's expression softened, her eyes showing a glimmer of sympathy. Mr. Travers, I'm so sorry you had to be put in this position. You did nothing to deserve it, and it's an awful decision to make. But there is no alternative, and you're almost out of time. Hannah's revelation was a punch to the gut. I had been prepared for many things, a bitter battle against unseen forces, a final plea for mercy to the spirits, but not this. I was being asked to forfeit the very foundation of my identity, my successes, my accomplishments. To live on, but as a phantom in a life that could have been. What's the point of living if I'm left with nothing, Hannah? She then placed a comforting hand on mine. I know it's a lot of pressure to put on one person, but you'll still have you, with all your hopes, dreams, and passions. You'll still have the capacity to love, to feel, to experience life. Isn't that worth it? I kept my head down, considering my options. Finally, I looked up, meeting Hannah's worried gaze with resolve. All right, let's do it. What do we need to do? Hannah let out a relieved sigh before giving me a weak smile. I've brought most of the items we need for the ritual already. We'll also need a copy of your book. Okay, I'll get it. We cleared a spot under the oak tree in my backyard, and formed a stone circle, and then built a fire in the center of it. The sun was already setting when we finished. Holding a copy of my book in my trembling hands, I exchanged a glance with Hannah. The enormity of our decision hung heavy between us. You have to do this. This is your life, she reiterated, her voice shaking with emotion. And I nodded, unable to muster a response. I held my book over the flame, the heat nipping at my fingers. My heart sank as I remembered the countless hours, days, and months I invested into creating this story. It was more than just a book to me. It was a piece of my soul, and I was about to watch it burn, before I could second-guess myself, I dropped it right into the flames. The book caught fire instantly, the pages curling and blackening in the fire, and a sharp pang of loss shot through me, but I pushed it aside. Hannah interlaced her fingers with mine as we watched it burn. The atmosphere around us grew warmer, the flames reflecting in her emerald eyes, and she started to chant in an unfamiliar language, her voice growing louder and more forceful, as she went on. I watched in awe as the fire seemed to dance in rhythm with her words, and I could hear the echoes of other voices, disembodied and inhuman, chanting along with her. As she continued, I felt her hand growing cold and her grip weakening, and then her hand seemed to slip through my fingers like a fistful of sand. What's happening? She cried out in terror. I hesitated for a moment and then turned my gaze back to the flames and her eyes followed mine. The fire had burned through the cover of the hardback, revealing pages crossed out with a marker, and her grandmother's silver locket hidden between them. I'm sorry, Hannah, I confessed, my voice choked with guilt. I just couldn't give it all up. Oh my God, you altered the spell, she stammered, her form flickering and gradually fading. You just erased my family. Yes, I admitted, my heart heavy. I had to. You said it yourself, Hannah. A life for a life. The look of betrayal on her vanishing face was unmistakable. She opened her mouth, perhaps, to say something. But before she could, she disappeared completely, leaving me alone in the cool summer night. 
I stood there staring at the flame until it burned itself out, and I felt completely alone. I went back inside and out of morbid curiosity, I looked up the obituary for Lily Hastings. It stated that she had died at the age of five after falling into the frozen lake. There was no miracle, no scratching in a casket. She was just simply dead. I did feel some remorse for Hannah. She was just trying to help me and didn't deserve to be wiped from existence. But I hadn't asked to sacrifice my life for her grandmother's. My life had been hijacked, used, and manipulated. And all I did was take it back. My next novel, Echoes of the Past, was another critical and commercial success. The world saw the triumphant return of a favorite author, not knowing the ghost that lingered behind my successes. And out of a sense of guilt, I decided to dedicate the next novel to Hannah Sullivan, Lily Hastings, and all those forgotten from the Hastings family tree. <laughs>